السلام عليكم بيسعدني ان احنا نبدا السيشن اللي هيشرفنا فيها الدكتور شريف عمر شركه ليبتس الحقيقه عامله لنا سبورت جامد جدا من اول يوم بدانا الجمعيه واحنا فيري جريتفول لهم ويعني اتمنى التعاون ده يستمر على طول ان شاء الله وانتوا تستفيدوا واحنا نستفيد ان شاء الله الف شكر اتفضل البرزنتيشن بتاعتك هتبقى على الهايبريوريسيميا وعلى الدي في تي بريفنشن اتفضل شكرا Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here at the Egyptian Arthroscopy Association uh, annual conference. As, as mentioned by the good professor, we are a very proud supporter of this annual event, and we are happy to participate uh, every year. So thank you, Professor Ayad and Professor Ahmed, for inviting us to attend with the session this year. So at Liptis, we've been expanding our product portfolio, and the number of products that are on the market continue to increase in the Egyptian market and overseas. So we have a presentation to review some of the key launches and recent products in our portfolio. We start with on Siatem, our Fabuxistat brand of 40 to 80 milligrams for treatment of hyperuricemia in patients with gout. You know, gout, as we know, is the most common form of inflammatory arthritis. The prevalence has risen in recent decades. Uh, studies show that 60% of patients will experience a recurrent gout flare within one year of the initial manifestation, and 78% will experience a flare within two years of the first onset. Advanced gout is associated with reduced mobility and quality of life. It affects multiple facets of a person's life, with walking being the most pronounced area of impact for patients that have repeat gout flares. And so hyperuricemia is the most important risk factor for the development of gout. A high blood uric acid is associated with a statistically significant increased risk of death from card cardiovascular disease, stroke, congestive heart failure, or any cause overall. The ACR and ULAR, gu ULAR guidelines for the management of gout is to bring the serum uric levels down to less than six milligrams per deciliter or a target of less than five in patients with severe cases. Uh, overall, the minimum reduction is to less than six milligrams per deciliter. Now, xanthine oxidoreductase is the chemical that is most uh, important to address in the treatment of hyperuricemia because this catalyzes the oxidation of hypoxanthine into xanthine and further catalyzes it into uric acid. And there are two forms of the enzyme. There's the oxidized and the reduced form of the xanthine molecule, either xanthine oxidase or a xanthine dehydrogenase. And so Nsiatem is the Liptis brand of Febuxostat uh, used to treat uh, patients with gout in managing their hyperuricemia. The mode of action is uh, broken up into two locations. Both of them impact the conversion of the hypoxanthine to xanthine and further conversion of xanthine into uric acid because that the febuxostat and onsatem inhibits both the oxidized and reduced form of xanthine oxidase. In fact, onsatem is a non-purine selective inhibitor of xanthine oxidase 10 to 30 times more powerful and potent than allopurinol. And because it is a non-purine uh, inhibitor, it has no effect on purine or pyrimidine metabolism. When the comparison was made between Unciatem and lowering serum uric acid versus allopurinol, there are several studies that have been published. Uh, this particular study involved over 4,000 patients, and the outcomes showed that the reduction of serum urate from baseline was most pronounced with the febuxostat and Unciatem compared to allopurinol, and certainly much more than placebo. Unciatem showed a higher rate of achievement of target serum uric acid whether the target was six or five milligrams per deciliter compared to the achievement by allopurinol. In fact, patients whose target was six milligrams achieved a reduction in 60% of the patients compared to 38 in allopurinol. And for those with a lower target level, it achieved in 42% compared to only 15% of success in patients taking allopurinol. 
the time further to reach the target levels was lower with the febuxostatin and satum or the al compared to the allopurinol. About 86 days where the target was 6 milligrams and a further 53 days compared to the 90 days in patients taking allopurinol. So the conclusions in patients with gout and hyperuricemia, uncertain is significantly more effective and faster than allopurinol in achieving the recommended target serum uric acid levels. And uncertain is confirmed as an effective option for the treatment of hyperuricemia in patients diagnosed with gout. When we look at patients that have elevated levels of serum uric acid and calcium stones, in this particular study, there is a comparison of febuxostat, allopurinol, three or 200 milligrams depending on renal function, and placebo. And the outcome showed that the reduction in baseline uh, urinary uric acid excretion was dramatically more pronounced in the patients taking the statin, 59% compared to 39% in allopurinol, and 59% compared to 36% at six months in the reduction of urinary uric acid excretion. So in satem at 80 milligrams, significantly lowers 24-hour urinary uric acid excretion, much more than allopurinol in stone formers with high urinary uric acid excretion. For books is that in this particular study for cerebral and cardiorenovascular events prevention study, which involved over 1,000 patients comparing Fabuxostat and alpurinol over three years. Here, the secondary endpoint was the deterioration of renal impairment, which uh, was dramatically lower in patients taking on satem as compared to those taking alpurinol. The secondary endpoint looked at the cardiovascular disease and all causes of mortality. And so, in terms of safety, both products were quite similar. And in fact, when we look at the outcomes, uh, arteriosclerotic disease, heart failure, or death was lower, in fact, in the febuxostat group than the allopurinol group. Remember, uric acid, the problem is not just the manifestations in terms of kidney stones or in terms of gouty flares. There is overall increase in mortality for patients with elevated serum uric acid. And using febuxostat can help address the all-cause mortality. The indications for uncertain is the chronic management of hyperuricemia in patients with gout, kidney stones, and tumor lysis syndrome. Uh, the dosage is one 40 milligram tablet daily. After two weeks, if the target reduction in serum uric acid is not achieved, then the dose should be increased to 80 milligrams once a day. So when you treat your patients, you should reevaluate them after two weeks, take the blood levels, and make sure they're within the target range. If not, then double the dose to 80 milligrams once a day. There's no uh, interaction with food can be taken with or without food or antacids. Uh, adverse reactions, the most common are liver function abnormalities, nausea, uh, arthralgia, rash, and dizziness. If patients have moderate renal impairment, no dosage adjustment is required. If the creatinine clearance is less than 30, there's insufficient data to support use, and so it is not recommended. Furthermore, if patients have mild or moderate hepatic impairment, class A or B uh, in the pew level, no adjustment is required. If it's severe hepatic impairment, again, no studies have been conducted in those patient populations. Pregnancy category C and should be avoided for breastfeeding mothers. After initiation, when there's a gout flare, you should provide prophylaxis with NSAIDs or colchicine upon initiation for about six months because once you start to reduce the serum levels of uric acid, that can cause mobilization of the urate stores and can trigger another gouty attack. And so we want to avoid that by concurrently treating the patients with NSAIDs or colchicine. If the patient is already uh, receiving treatment, then it's not necessary to discontinue therapy during an attack. It may increase, increase liver enzymes, and so we want to obtain the panel of liver function tests, the baseline, and do not initiate if you're outside three upper levels of normal in the AST or total bilirubin is more than two times upper limits of normal. Uh, the contraindication is only for patients being treated with azathioprine or 6 mercaptopurine. So when you look at the comparison of unciatum versus allopurinol, unciatum is a non-purine analog. It's a selective and potent inhibitor of both forms of xanthine oxidase. It does not affect other enzymes, so it does not impact purine or pyrimidine synthesis. Uh, starting dose is 40 milligrams a day to increase to 80 milligrams a day if not brought under control within two weeks. No dose adjust 
requirement necess necessary for patients with mild to moderate renal or hepatic impairment, uh, and no hypersensitivity has been uh, reported. Dosage is one tablet daily for patients suffering from gout, kidney stones, or tumor license syndrome, uh, 40 milligrams a day. After two weeks, you can increase to 80 milligrams if sufficient control is not achieved. Uh, so insatiatum is a potent selective antioxidase inhibitor, more effective in lowering serumeric acid levels than allopurinol, faster onset of effect with a safety profile comparable to allopurinol. Delays the progression of renal dysfunction. Insatiatum needs no dose adjustment in mild to moderate renal hepatically impaired patients, few drug-drug and drug-food interactions, and is a convenient once-a-day dose. Unsatim is available now in Egypt, and in fact has been shipped to several other countries uh, around the region. Uh, Vaxato, uh, you know quite well, is our brand of rivaroxaban, 10 milligrams, a trusted name in prevention of DVT. We know deep vein thrombosis incidence can be 40 to 60 percent in patients undergoing major orthopedic surgery. Of course, the main complication of DVT is life-threatening pulmonary embolism. Patients afflicted may die within one month of diagnosis in 10 to 30 percent of the cases. 30 percent of those with DVT or PE will have a recurrence within the next 10 years. And so when we look to assess the patients, it's important to develop a risk factor assessment. And this algorithm, essentially just a, a, a simple sheet where you can identify the risk factor score by adding the scores across the various items, can show you that patients of five or more are at the highest risk of developing DVT, and for them, a factor 10 inhibitor is among treatments indicated for prophylaxis. But when you look at patients in cases that are not as aggressive, an obese patient with a leg plaster who is elderly, in fact, this patient achieves a risk factor score of four, and four is still considered high risk for developing of DVT. In those cases, factor to any inhibition is still indicated as prophylaxis. Uh, the American College of Chest Physicians has their guidelines on the prevention of venous thromboembolism in orthopedic surgery patients. Rivaroxaban is among the category of drugs class 1B uh, to be used for prevention of DVT in patients undergoing total hip or knee arthroplasty as well as for major orthopedic surgery. Vaxato is a direct factor to any inhibitor. Inhibiting one molecule amplifies the reduction of 1,000 thrombin molecules because it impacts both the intrinsic and extrinsic pathways that make up the blood coagulation uh, pathway to coagulation. When we look at patients that look at thromboprophylaxis uh, after knee arthroscopy. In this particular case, it was a 60-year-old patient undergoing arthroscopic meniscotomy, no personal history, but her sister had pulmonary embolism after pregnancy, and she had a BMI of 31. Uh, evidence shows that even patients with arthroscopic surgery, certain patients are at risk of venous thromboembolism. If we categorize her risks across this scheme, we see that her total score is eight. She's obese, family history, elderly, and arthroscopic procedure greater than 60 minutes. And so she, in fact, is at high risk of developing DVT, the highest risk. Her score was eight, which is well above the five threshold determining the highest risk patients. There was a randomized trial involving patients undergoing knee arthroscopy showed a benefit of VTE prophylaxis with low molecular weight heparin and with rivaroxaban. Rivaroxaban uh, was studied for thromboprophylaxis uh, for uh, non-elective orthopedic trauma surgery in Switzerland on over 400 patients. They were randomized, half received viroxaban, half received the standard of care. And in fact, in the outcome, essentially was you had a 50% reduction in the incidence of any symptomatic thrombolic event any, and 50% reduction in a venous thromboembolic event for patients that were given rivaroxaban as compared to the standard of care. The conclusion is that the rivaroxaban is an appropriate oral alternative to prophylaxis and can be used uh, instead of injectable medications for patients that are non-compliant. Recently, the FDA has approved a new indication for rivaroxaban for the tr prevention of VTE in hospitalized acutely ill medical patients at risk for thromboembolism, but not at high risk of bleeding. In the study published in the New England Journal of Medicine, it looked at rivaroxaban 
for thromboprophylaxis in acutely ill patients. In this particular study of over 8,000 patients, they were randomized to receive subcutaneous anoxaprine versus oral rivaroxaban uh, for up to, up to five weeks. And so the primary outcome was looking at asymptomatic, proximal, or symptomatic VTE up to 10 days and up to 35 days. The results showed that the incidence was about the same at 10 days, but at 35 days, patients taking rivaroxaban had a reduced incidence of VTE compared to those taking enoxaprine. In terms of safety, non-major bleeds were quite similar for both, and it shows here that extended duration of rivaroxaban reduced the risk of venous thromboembolism, and there was a slight increase of bleeding in the patients taking that medication. And so the idea here in using rivaroxaban, uh, the contraindications, of course, are hypersensitivity to any of the uh, components, hepatic disease with active coagulopathy, clinically significant active bleeding, pregnancy, or lactation. When we look at drug-drug interactions, some drugs will increase the risk of bleeding, others will reduce the efficacy, and that's why we have online, you can download a Vexato app, which keeps track and confirms to you all the drugs that may interact to increase or reduce the efficacy. For patients with creatinine clearance greater than 30, it is safe to use. 15 to 29 can be used with caution. Less than 15, use is not recommended. No dose adjustment is required otherwise in elderly patients. If there are cases of overdose, then bleeding should be management according to the severity and location of the hemorrhage. Uh, in Egypt, they have Nova 7 available that can be used to manage any overdose with a single IV bolus. The algorithm to treat bleeding uh, is, is well known and it's available on the application that you can download off Google Play or the App Store. And so when we look at the use of Vaxato as prevention of DVT, we have to balance any risk of bleeding, which is minimal, compared to the risk of pulmonary embolism, which can lead to death, cost of treatment, cost of recurrence, and other complications. So Vaxato 10 milligram is indicated for the prevention of VTE in patients undergoing total hip or knee replacement or hip fracture surgery. And the dosage is one tablet, 10 milligram tablet daily, six to 10 hours after surgery. For patients undergoing hip surgery, it's five week duration, those undergoing knee, sur knee surgery, it is two weeks of recommendation. It should be given up to two hours before the next scheduled dose of the low molecular weight heparin. Uh, we package it in aluminum and aluminum blisters to protect the active integrity of the active ingredient from any light degradation. This maintains the integrity of the active ingredient and protects it from any degradation from moisture or light or humidity, no matter where it is stored. Rivaroxaban and Vaxato is superior of a superior efficacy compared to other anticoagulants. It's a higher safety profile compared to anoxaprine, avoids heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, has better patient compliance. It is oral instead of an injectable treatment, no need for dose adjustment in moderate renal impairment or the elderly, and no need for INR monitoring with low interaction of food and other medications. Uh, Vaxato 10 milligrams is available across Egypt and the neighboring markets. Our final recent introduction is Prenorelax, uh, the first and only extended release uh, muscle relaxant. It's a 24 hour acting cyclobenzaprine, 30 milligram capsule. Uh, we know cyclobenzaprine is a, a well known product used for many years with efficacy that is well known. The challenge, of course, is the dizziness and somnolence associated with the immediate release dosing. This causes many patients to use only one tablet at bedtime and then they lose the benefits during the day. Prenorelax is manufacturing using a unique diffucaps technology where the active ingredient is embedded in multiple layers of polymers to enable slow release over a 24 hour time frame. This reduces the adverse effects and provides a consistent and sustained efficacy of the active ingredient cyclobenzaprine. The efficacy and the pharmacokinetics of the extended release cyclobenzaprine, as we see here, it peaks after a few hours, and then it slowly degrades over 24 hours. As compared to yellow, the immediate release where it peaks, it drops, next dose peaks and drops, and then the next dose. So you avoid the roller coaster up and down with the immediate release. The sustained release peaks after a few hours and slowly degrades over the 24-hour period. Of course, the warning for any cyclobenzaprine product is to avoid 
use of alcohol and other CNS depressants. Uh, Prenorlax contains cyclobenzaprine with proven efficacy in muscle spasm management. Prenorlax provides an extended release effect, causing less somnolence and drowsiness with a simple once a day dosage regimen. Prenorlax provides your patients with better compliance. Prenorlax is indicated for relief of muscle spasm associated with musculoskeletal conditions. The dose is one capsule once a day uh, to be taken with or without food up to four hours before bedtime. So while the patient is asleep, the bioavailability will peak. And so when we look at the summary of the Liptus musculoskeletal portfolio, we start with Dorfin, our flagship uh, alpha D glucosamine product, which has been in the market for many, many years and is well known among the audience today. Dorfin is still your first choice for the treatment of osteoarthritis. Vaxato, 10 milligrams for the prevention of DVT for patients undergoing total hip or knee replacement, avoiding the incompatibility of injectables and the compliance issues with a convenient once a day oral dosage form, reducing the risk of DVT and pulmonary embolism. Prenorlax, the first and only extended release cyclopenzaprine muscle relaxant, and Onciatem for the treatment of hyperuricemia in patients with gout. Thank you. Any question for uh, Dr. Sharif? Okay, no. Dr. Uh, Ahab, في سحب على أربع اتنين شاشة واتنين موبايل حطها هنا حطها هنا ممكن حد من حضراتكم يجي يسحب الورق حطها على الحرف على الحرف حد من الشباب حد من الشباب يجي يسحب الورق يا جماعة تعالى يا دكتور عمرو بعد إذنك كسبني <تصفيق> خلاص مش مشكلة بقى تعال مصطفى تعال مصطفى يلا اسحب اي ورق اسحب اي خلاص يا عم بتاع عمرو ستمية اربعة وثلاثين يا جماعة الله please come up front 634 if you have the number come up front ده ايه شاشة ده ولا ايه this is a, a mobile phone mobile phone yes the winner please come up <laughs> okay. Congratulations. Mustafa, tell, tell us where you're from. Oh, it's Habah the Tanyal. Hena Mustafa, is it? Sophia Habibia. Six one five. Six one five. Six one five. Da, Dr. Ahmed Farid, young. Mobile phone. We have our winner. Yes. Is Habib Mustafa at the end? Congratulations. Taufiq, Dr. Ahmed. Taufiq, Habib. Taufiq. Yeah. 50, 50, 5 0, 5 0, 5 0. لا ما تجيش. فيش 50 اسحب واحدة تانية. Going once. اسحب واحدة تانية. Two one two. Two twelve. Two one two. يلا حبيبي اطلع اطلع بسرعة انا اوكي هات واحدة ثالثة انا congratulations توفي يا حبيبي ها يا مصطفى I think this number was with كاسكانيا this this I think 249 249 Did this hard rain? Dive cut. Our last winner. Alessandro. 
اهو يلا اوكي حبيبي لم ال ليبتس ممكن تاخدوا البتاع ده عشان نبتدي شغلنا توفيق يا حبيبي ثانك يو فيري ماتش فور ليبتس ثانك يو يا دكتور ثانك يو ثانك Now we are talking uh, about the session five with the rotator uh, cuff tears. Uh, I have the pleasure here to have uh, uh, Dr. Basim Flieger, uh, our famous uh, consultant in Germany uh, and also in Egyptian, Egypt here, uh, together with uh, my friend uh, Alex Castagna and uh, I'm very happy that he accepted his, our invitation here to, uh, to be here. And also, yesterday, he prepared two lectures of the two missing Italian uh, to international guest, uh, guest speakers. Thank you, Dr. Castagna. And uh, now I let uh, the mic to my uh, senior doctor, uh, Passim, to introduce uh, uh, the first topic. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you that you brought uh, Alex Castagna. I, uh, I don't know if you know, uh, Dr. Castagna has published a very nice book uh, uh, about uh, arthroscopic transosseous rotator cuff repair. Uh, I read it. It is very good. I recommend you all to read it. You will learn a lot from it. Um, so, uh, I would Please, uh, Dr. Katama will talk about pasta lesion, when and how to treat it. Thank you, Basim. Thank you, Mohammed and Michael. And uh, again, happy to be here very much. And this is my nothing to do with my presentation. When and how to treat the pasta lesion. First of all, when we speak about partial rotator cuff tears, we speak about a large family of condition. You may have a borsal, you may have articular, you may have both with different severity of the lesion. It is not enough because if you go on a sagittal plane that you may eventually see that the tear may expand uh, anteriorly or posteriorly involving the coracohumeral ligament and the margin, superior margin of the subscap or the anterior insertion of the supra that at the end now we know they are blending together. So first of all again we need to see what is the incidence and the prevalence of this partial rotator cuff tears. Here there are many many studies about it but what is important that I outline in this presentation oops, sorry, is that the articular side tears are probably 91% of all the partial thickness tear. So they're very, very common. Biomechanics, when you have a partial tear, the stress uh, uh, on the tendon is increasing, and maybe they are even more painful than a small full thickness tear. Healing, it is not demonstrating, demonstrated, but probably is not happening spontaneously. And the progression, you see here this study from Yamanaka, uh, the partial tears, they may enlarge, at least in one case out of two, progressing to a full thickness tear. So, this is something about the more recent literature, about the progression of the symptomatic full thickness and partial thickness. And you see that um, full thickness tear were the most variable risk factors for tear enlargement, while the, the partial tears are slowly progressing into it. This is another paper, from, always from, from uh, Japan, where you have this progression that is 47% of the shoulder during a period that is a little bit less than two years, 
so especially if you have a medium a medium sized tear then the structural evolution of non-operatively treated high grade partial thickness tear of the supraspinatus tear you may have that a progression of 16 percent in this study some tears were healing even healing uh, or reduced inside at the control so again this is a large group of conditions may evolve or not but most of the times they are symptomatic in order to understand this tear i always recommend to explore your tendon on both sides uh, this uh, when i did my fellowship with steve snyder it was exactly 30 years ago uh, it was teaching me just put a, a little absorbable suture like this through the articular tear then go to the other side and see what happens on the other side so you have the view in exactly the same area in order to understand then when we have this we can have bursal intratendinous articular and the options are physiotherapy conservative debridement acromioplasty complete and repair or transtendon repair i will stay only on the articular side that as we already said are the most common condition for this kind of partial rotator cuff tear and we start with the history because pasta is exactly this shoulder uh, 24 years ago I was operated by Steve I like to play tennis very much and I was good but not that good so I finally gave up but I, I played so much enough to injure my my shoulder and I developed a pasta at that time the pasta lesion was not existing and so this is Steve uh, and I'm here with Christian Gerber and Steve desperately was trying to teach me how to do a shoulder arthroscopy I was so bad that finally he, he tried to teach me uh, some, some golfing. But anyways, he scoped my shoulder. We have seen this, uh, he saw this lesion, but I was awake. And at that time, we didn't know about it. I am Italian, partial articular supraspinatus tendon avulsion. This is the, the history of it. Which are the treatment options. You can simply debride it. You may complete and repair. Or you can make an in situ, this is Latin, not in situ, in situ, transtendon repair. These are the three options available. And this is the way we do it. You see the video here uh, that I use a spinal, you can use different techniques as you will see. I go with the spinal needle through the good tendon. I send any monofilament. I retrieve to the anterior, anterior superior cannula. You see the drawing here from the book Steve, the book of Steve. Then I retrieve one suture, and I repeat this for three, four, uh, three or six times, depending. And at the end, you achieve this repair of the original footprint. Then other techniques came out after this, and this is, uh, you know, the double pulley, double row. You do whatever you want, do it well. But then, since it is my shoulder, I did quite a few studies about it. This is something on the American Journal of Sports Medicine 2009 and I studied my series and I noticed that 41 percent were reporting some pain for, for a few months not forever but some pain in this position and I noticed that this was related to the retraction of the deeper layer so I understood that if you have a severe retraction of the deeper layer you may avoid this you may have this problem then I started thinking and watching this drawing here, you see that we have this anchor coming through the tendon and then making the repair. Well, if you do this exactly this way, you will create what? A mismatch of the tension on the tendon because you have the superior fibers and the deeper fibers. And if you put them all together, you may have this tension, this bad feeling from the patient. This is why I did a little thing that is to prevent this. I come with my spinal needle very close, very, very close to the insertion in the more the bursal side and then harvesting this on this side. If I do this, I may prevent any crimping of the tendon and then avoid the mismatch. <coughs> a little thing that it was improving me so much. Then this is a, later on, I published this paper in 2013 that is a double blind randomized study. I compared the complete and repair and the transtendon. And you see here the results of it. Transtendon, the constant score 28%, 33, so very close. 
non-statistically significant, as mentioned uh, this morning in the beautiful lecture about the papers. But then when you explode the constant score, you notice that the strength is a little better, still not significant, but better, in, in, the, in the taking down the tendon. These are the results of my paper. But let go, let's go to other papers. And again, I like very much biology, because we are carpenters, uh, very li little we think about it. Uh, biology, of course, when you treat the tendon there, you may have some fibrous tissue that we don't like. This is an American good guy, uh, Xavier Duraldi, uh, that is comparing the clinical results and the site in situ repair, and he said that it is safe and effective. And this is coming from Shin here, that is reporting that you can, may get good results, whatever you do, either taking down the tendon or making it in situ. However, it, it says that maybe it is less invasive if you do the in situ repair. This is now an Italian study, 2017, uh, that is recommending to make a repair of these tendon tears when it is 50% of more. And this is a new technique that I found in the literature very, very recently, so I brought it here to you in the uh, journal Shoulder and Elbow, where you can eventually use you may eventually use um, the biceps tendon to reinforce here. That is something that I did when I was a young boy, but some pain, some pain was left there. So the results that they reported were pretty good. It is not complicated. You may eventually reinforce it this way too. I, I don't have any experience with this. So they say that is, uh, this is a useful treatment modality capable to preserve the rotator cuff uh, footprint. But then, I think that we need to go a little deeper into it. It is not just to place an anchor or two anchors and six stitch or whatever. We need to understand what is happening in that area. You know, this is a dissection that we did with Nicole Pouliard uh, of the superior uh, glenohumeral ligament. That is a complex, as well as the inferior one. And it, it is a complex with variable anatomy and if you include this in your repair, you may eventually create a stiff shoulder. It is, it is a risk, potentially. So it must be very clear to you that it is a potential risk of this, of this eventual or procedure. And again, the, they are recommending to do this 50% or more, but then we have a different family. Please focus on this. Um, uh, Pietro Tonino described this for the throwers, for the banker to repair, the slap lesion, and so on. The throwers are a special family. So in the older head athletes, uh, you may have often associated other pathologies. You may have some GERD as described, the glenohumeral internal rotation deficit, and, and some attenuation of the structures. And the surgical treatment, hmm, question mark. Rotator cuff debridement with the treatment of current, uh, concurrent symptom, uh, symptomatic pathology is important because in this patient the biomechanics are different. Repair is not always recommended and the tear can be acquired to allow or preserve the motion that is needed for that specific gesture. And again, also don't forget, this is my friend Pietro Rondelli, you may have a pasta lesion of the subscap, and it is instead quite interesting because this is involving the stability of the biceps. So I'm very careful to check this quite carefully when I see my patient. So the take home message for this pasta repair, when you have a tear more than 50% and the large footprint exposure, repair it. Do whatever you want in situ or complete and repair with a classical technique, but beware of the tension mismatch. That is also true when you take down the tendon somehow. In the elderly, degenerative tears and tendon retractions, it's retraction in the deeper layer, please complete the tear and make a formal repair. In the overhead athletes, conservative versus repair of the concomitant lesions and the breed the partial articular uh, side tear. This is my recipe. Uh, that I apply in my activity and just in case for the passionate for shoulder uh, this is this uh, fall imposed on the European shoulder and elbow my biannual course with live surgery last time we had Pascal and only bad cases we spent three days 
a wonderful time in Milan with no coronavirus. And in 2022, I will chair the World Congress in Rome about shoulder and elbow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. Now the next speaker is uh, Dr. Simoni. What do we have to consider when treating cough tears? So thank you again. Um, what to consider when we're treating cuff tears? Cuff tears are probably one of the most variable diagnostic and variable symptoms disease that we know. So I'm a white person. I like to understand what I do. I like to understand why people tell things, uh, even when you cannot understand, but I like to search. So first, why anatomy is crucial? I think that uh, Dr. Castagna showed us how is important the past, and the past lesion exists because people one time in their life described what is a footprint, because first we didn't know about the footprint. And that's the same when you evaluate uh, the anatomy. So that's not the truth, that's the truth now. So Hiro Sugaya published in the GBJS the exact way where the rotator minors, the infraspinatus, the supraspinatus, and the subscap will insert. And if you can see, the infraspinatus has the larger amount of insertion, and sometimes it goes further to the half, anterior half of the humeral head. So many times when you see that area here, that's not to be debride, that's uh, infraspinatus in its normal attachment. So why does the cuff fall apart so often? Why is it so common and what's the basic science behind the cuff tendinopathy and the progression of a tear? First, we have to understand the basic concepts of a tendinopathy. It can be degenerative with vascular issues, traumatic, microtraumatic, or even related to a biomechanical sequence of events like, the, for example, the throwing shoulder cascade. So let's begin with hypoxia. Uh, first, we have to understand what is ap apoptosis, which is a programmed cellular death uh, with no release of toxical cells. So programmed cell death is kind of programmed in our life, but what we see in people who has cuff tears is this marker, BINP3 level, is very high, 10 to 15 times more. So those guys show that hypoxia is important. What about genetics? There's a bunch of papers showing that there is some genetic issues related to uh, cuff tears. Smoking, something that, uh, that before being published, everyone who does shoulder surgery realized that uh, smokers were a candidate for having that problem and they are more painful in the post-op. And then there are a lot of papers, this paper is from Lisa Gallitz and Kenya Magushi, showing that there is strong association between smoking and rotator cuff tears, and it's also dose and amount defect. Hypercholesterolemia, it means if you have high cholesterol, if you have obesity, you're also a candidate for that. So if, if you see there's an analogy between the same causes that can risk your heart for the shoulder. I always say that the problem is that I cannot make someone stop smoking and getting thin because of the cuff, because they don't do this because of their heart. So the, the problems are the same. We live into hypoxia. We live into less uh, loss of blood in this area. What about impingement? Well, impingement syndrome was very popular in the 80s. We talk about the three kinds of acromion. Uh, now we, we think that there is a role for impingement, um, basic when you have some really uh, 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 alterations in the inferior acromion, but it's not the cause like it used to be. Scapular dyskinesia, that's very important. And if you remember uh, the near 99 book, Shoulder Reconstruction, he talked about scapular angle in the outlet view. And Ben Kleber shows that if you have probably a malfunction of the scapula, we also will narrow and also will cause uh, uh, problems in the subacromial area. So always begin to examine your shoulders from the back or at least put the back examination part of it. You will see how those people have scapular malfunction. What about sign and symptoms? It's so variable. Uh, uh, people with cuff tears can have just from nothing to everything. They can have no symptoms or they can even raise their arm and don't sleep at night. Why? This pain with motion, pain, night pain, inability to perform sports activities, variable weakness, impingement sign, job sign, speed sign, why there is such a gigantic variation. So we have a lot of issues to put in this cake. Posture, muscle imbalance, professional use, don't do exercise. Oh, I do too much exercise. I do exercise in the wrong way. 
When I'm coming back to sports, I don't do it progressively. Oh, emotional distress, depression, association with instability. So everything can make a part. Everything can have a role in the symptoms. What about classification system? There are more than 100 classification systems for cuff tears. Uh, it's, very, uh, it's very odd when you say like 100 classification, what will I use? So I look what will make my own decision on treating. And it's a relationship between clinical and MRI. So I look for age, professional activities, sports, mental status, trauma, uh, also workman's compensation sometimes plays a role. And then I can have my MRI and partial. Which kind of partial? Is bursa or articular? Is a pasta lesion? Has the lamination? How about the quality? Or complete tendon retraction, less or more than 3.5, tendon quality. And now I begin to know what paths should I take. So I like to use that concept of the, what we call the yom and the oim. So that's the young old man and the old young man. There's a different those are different people to treat. This guy in the left, which is, was famous, like he was lost inside his house in New York or in Chicago, I don't know exactly. Yeah, home alone. He is very weak. He's not a candidate sometimes for a, a, a good approach. This guy in the right, he's older, but he's sportive. If you say you cannot do sports anymore, uh, that's different. So you have to treat those patients, including who they are. I don't like to use partial and complete. I think that this, like, like Castanha said, a lot of variety. And what I, what I see is that when you say that's a partial tear, sometimes you mean that it's not as severe. Yeah, in most of the time it's not as severe. But we know partial tears that come from reports from MRI, and those are severe lesions. That's a partial tear, but you can see that the cuff tendon is so thin that when it ruptures here, it's a jump from a partial tear to a retracted tear with no time in the middle. So you have to evaluate not only by names, but by the anatomy. What about treating those patients? First, prevention. Prevention, I think, is important before the, tough, the tear begins. Muscle balance, non-smoking, cholesterol, every, everything has to be taught. We have to talk to the guy. You know, you're smoking. It's not good. You, maybe you should lose your weight. Maybe you should do some, some, some gym. When you do some gym, maybe you should rehab and do a lot of back exercise because people tend to do a lot of front exercise because they want to be beautiful. It's nice to have a very nice back major. But what about the back? What about scapular? If we know that if the scapular does not work well, you're going to have problem. So we sh I think that we, sh we can prevent a lot of those issues with a good instruction, working to that together with the, with the physical uh, professionals or the physical therapists, whatever. Uh, if you go to the surgical, also, transtendon complete or not complete, single rubber roll, double roll. And then we come from the biologic, which is very, very studied now. I think in a slowly way, should we use PRP? Uh, what, we, what, is about, what about the blood from rough areas like the crimson duvet described by Steven Snyder? What about MMP inhibitors? Then we have to think about conservative or repair, single or double row or trans also equivalent. Should we do an acromioplasty or non anacromioplasty? What about the post op regime? Is aggressive or non aggressive? All those questions have to be in mind and individualized. What about the cuff, single or double row, or transosseal? Okay, now there's a lot of biomechanical studies showing that the double row is uh, stronger in the, in, in the repair. In my country, in Brazil, we, have a, we struggle a lot to get anchors. So if, if I say to the guy, I want four anchors, I am in trouble. He's going to say, well, maybe you can fix with two anchors. And the explanations are not so easy. So there is also two or more ways to see the same room. That's the easy way down, and that's the scary way up. So we're seeing this audience, and we can see the, the, the way that we're going to repair in uh, different, different ways. There's a lot of literature comparing double roll with single roll. Double roll repair is able to tolerate a significant lower to failure. There is paper also related to uh, showing that it's more cost effective. But in fact, there is not a lot of papers showing that the clinical outcomes are so much better. Uh, I believe there is, we're beginning to see less failure, less recurrence, but uh, in, in the way that we are right now, we can do a good uh, single row approach as well. If you don't have ability, if you don't have the, the right material to do that, a single row is still an option. But if you really have good tools, if you have the possibility of using different anchors, uh, maybe we should, we should look for, 
for doing a double row at this time. Um, doxycycline, I've been using since, uh, I, I remember that in the academy in 2009, I remember it was Steven Weber, he presented the use of doxycycline as an MMP inhibitor. I've been using that, but it's still very anecdotal. We don't know how long we're going to use, we don't know how much we're going to use, but as an antibiotic, I would like to use that mainly for, for enhancing uh, healing. So more papers showing that uh, cuff, uh, single row or double row will lead to good results. The, the, the paper uh, in the back showing, in, in, the, in down showing that it's, there is already a, a statistical significance in the results with double row. Um, we, we don't know. There's a lot of papers coming in the literature on that to see what's the right way. Why acromioplasty? Well, we see that the acromion is round. We see there's a lot of papers showing that there is no uh, difference of doing or not. So my approach is I palpate, I palpate external. If I feel that there is irregularity down, then I, I probably do, like I see here, we palpate this spur of bone. I don't think that we should leave it there. I think that we should smooth it down. But I know when I palpate with my troker that I'm going to be using some smoothing in this area like Dr. Rick Masson liked to say, the smoothing procedure. Um, if I don't see that, if I don't see if there is like a spur, I will probably leave everything alone because I really don't think that it will make such a difference. However, we can have bleeding post acromioplasty, and that's something that we should take into consideration, or also make what Steven Snyder have taught us, the crimson duvet, which is making holes in the greater tuberosity to enhance bleeding in this, re in, in this place. And in my hand, that works pretty well. So if I have this defect, if I do a single row, if I cannot do a double row, if I have this area, it's very harmless to put some punctures there before you close the, the fluid, and then you have this, what we call the crimson duvet. So what can we control right now? We can recognize, we can prevent, and we can instruct our candidates for a treatment. If they are smokers or lose weight, whatever we can. Indications, previous pre rehab if possible. I like to go first. If you don't have a complete year, a complete year try to make a rehab in those patients. Recognize pattern and, and repair tension. Look and treat the lamination. Surgical technique, if you can try to restore the footprint. How are we going to use PRP, doxycycline? That's something to be seen. And in my post-op, I'm not aggressive. I like to enhance healing. I like to leave those shoulders. I'm not so afraid of stiffness in the post-op. Actually, in some cases, I like a little bit of stiffness in the beginning because those patients, if they are very, very fast, sometimes they get problems. And remember that we should keep on reading. Cuff changes every day. Cuff changes for different, different systems, cap, superior capsular construction and biologics and uh, any kind of patch. So we keep on reading. There's some new articles, articles that's, that, that says something that is against what we believe. For example, uh, this, this paper from Campbell published in the journal Shodanel in 2009, saying that the stump of the cuff has more stem cells than the bone. So how much should we really debride or not is something that, we, that changes every day. And I think that we keep on reading because cuff tears are one of the most uh, uh, changeable subjects in the, in the medicine area. So again, shukran. Thanks so much. I have a pleasure now to uh, uh, call Dr. Mohammed Gamal Mursi. Uh, I'm proud to do that because Dr. Mursi was one of the first colleagues who came to Germany to me and spent many months uh, learning shoulder surgery, which he translated that in his very uh, nice career. And uh, he will talk to us now about uh, star repair for large and massive rotator cuff tears. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bassem. It's my pleasure to have you here uh, uh, seeing my presentation. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, today I present the star repair for uh, large and massive rotator cuff tears. Uh, actually, arthroscopic approach to rotator cuff repair has become the standard practice for the many surgeons. And this is because of the excellent visualization, less post-operative pain, 
with less morbidity. We all know the types of cuff tears started from the partial, small, medium, large, massive, and irreparable, and our concern for uh, this technique is about the large and massive tears. Indeed, large and massive tears are a true challenge, and endless debate still exists about how to deal with such tears after failure of conservative treatment. Many surgeons favor only simple debridement and with a sub with acromioplasty. However, the majority of these tears have now been treated successfully with arthroscopic repair. Yet, still debate about the optimal repair strategy as you just heard from Dr. Simoni. And this is because of the retail rates up to 20%. So the problem of the large and massive tears, as they started with the single row repair, they found that the recurrence rate up to 94% with Im imaging proven retear of any type in single uh, row repair. So the problem is the retear with the uh, single row. This leads to the development of the double row technique, whether the actual double row or the suture bridge technique with the or the transosseous equivalent. Large and massive tears had the difficult to get the lateral portion of the cuff into an atomic position and results in limited rotator cuff footprint contact area. As the medial row anchors are tight, the cuff is punched and pulled medially. And these are the studies of the retear following large and massive cuff tears. They found that even with double row cuff repair, there is a failure medial to the medial anchors at the musculotendinous junction with a well-fixed tendon to the greater tuberosity. Another study showed also failure of a double row in large and massive tears with the, uh, 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 at the medial row anchors with the sutures are not and not pulling through the tendon causing impingement. So even the double row didn't solve the problem. This is another systematic review with 14 study included 20, uh, 260 rotator cuff retairs. Repair technique had significant impact on the estimated incidence rate. This is what the conclusion of the study. And they concluded also that the double row and suture bridge techniques increased the risk there is increased risk of medial cuff failure. So, modification in the surgical techniques in both double row and suture bridge repairs can help to decrease that risk. In, in other words, that even improvement of the repair technique with double row didn't solve the problem. There is also retail rates with double row up to 30%, and these rates increase more higher in cases with large to massive tears. So, still we need a more effective repair strategy. So, what is the solution? So, the solution can be maximizing the rotator cuff footprint contact area that may improve the healing potential. Or in other words, putting a third row of fixation between the medial and lateral rows that tied before the medial anchors. And this is suggested by Dr. Ostrander in uh, 2000, 2012 that he made a, a biomechanical study to measure the contact pressure and contact surface area of, his, of its triple row. They found that there is increased contact pressure higher in the triple row group compared to the double row. And they found also with the triple row there is a smaller gap formation, higher, higher ultimate failure loads, fewer instances of tendons tearing at the sutures with highly secured footprint. So it started with the actual double row, you put two rows of anchor, then suture bridge and the triple row. So diagrammatically this is the Double row, when you put medial row and lateral row. This is the suture bridge, when you put medial row and use the sutures of this medial row to put it on the lateral aspect of the knotless anchors. 
and the supposed procedure, the triple row that you use, medial, middle, and lateral rows of the ankles. So it means that the triple row has a triple effect. With the double row, actual double row, you have a good anatomical footprint restoration, but no contact pressure. So to solve this problem came the suture bridge technique or the link double row that you have better compression, put medial row here, using the sutures, put it on the lateral aspect to compress the footprint contact area. But actually, this configuration is a double row from the f uh, picture, but it is single row from the function because if the medial row fails, then the lateral row has no function. And this uh, converts, uh, leads to failure of the uh, construct as proven with the studies. From this came the idea of the triple row that has the triple effect that you have anatomical footprint restoration like the double row, better contact bridge like the suture bridge, and less tension or tension-free repair of the triple row. So maybe the triple row like the pyramid of Egypt may be at the apex of the pyramid. This was the triple row. What about the star repair? The star repair or the modification of link triple row technique that in the original triple row, we just it's supposed that to put the middle anchor here and without linking it to the lateral row. So it is separate from the conistra. But with the star repair, we link also the middle anchor to the construct. So we started with putting the two medial anchors, passing all the sutures in a mattress fashion, then putting the middle one in a sample, and then taking sutures from the medial, from the medial, sorry, it moves around. Taking the sutures from the medial and middle and put it together into uh, lateral knotless anchors in a star-shaped fashion. This is one of the examples of a large or massive tear. And you can see here arthroscopically when we enter through the joint, looking from intra-articular to identify the size of the tear and to do some mobilization in order to bring the tendon back to the uh, footprint using uh, the arthroscopic instruments that helps a lot to mobilize the tendon back uh, to the uh, footprint. Then to check the biceps, as usually we take the, include the biceps in the construct and prepare the footprint. Then going to the subacromial space, doing uh, acromioplasty when needed. Then shifting the scope. This is very important to the lateral portal to look and end on to the, uh, the tear. And you can see how large the tear is from the subacromial space. Then starting the procedure of the repair by inserting the anteromedial anchor just behind the articular cartilage of the humerus and using the penetrating instruments to pass through the uh, cuff and the biceps tendon uh, together to make it enodesis. And uh, after passing the sutures through the biceps, I made it anatomy. Then putting the posteromedial uh, anchor and uh, uh, about one to two centimeter away from the anterior one and looking from the lateral using the penetrating instruments from the posterior to take the sutures of the posteromedial anchor and passing it through the supra and the infraspinatus. And you can see how degenerated and frayed uh, the, the cuff and separated in two layers. And after completing the passage of the sutures of the posteromedial uh, anchor, I insert the middle anchor, or I call it the repositioning anchor, at this anchor at the tip of the greater tuberosity, at the end of the uh, cuff, then passing just two simple sutures of this middle anchor through the substance of the 
cuff, one anterior and one uh, posterior. And this is the important anchor because we tied first the middle anchor to bringing the cuff back to its uh, anatomical position and to allow a less tension or tension-free repair of the medial anchors. And after a closing, a closure of the uh, middle anchor, I tied the medial uh, mattress uh, sutures. I started with the anterior one and then the posterior. Finally, I took two limbs from the anterior medial with the one of the middle anchor and put it with the knotless anchor in the triple row, one centimeter away from the greater tuberosity. And similarly, I take also two from the posterior with one of the middle and put it with the knotless anchor at the posterior aspect of the, uh, of the cup to ending the construct like a, a, a star shape repair. And then uh, we can see at the end complete coverage of the humeral head, uh, shifting the scope to the lateral portal to check the complete closure of the defect with covering back of the humeral head. And then going back to the articular side to, to see from down that the defect is closed. This is before the repair and this is the final repair. And this is the post-operative MRI of the, uh, one of the cases, so the complete closure of the uh, defect. So why star linked triple row? In the original triple row, as we see here, this is the original triple row that you put unlinked anchor here. If the media row fails, as reported in the literature, then the construct will be as if it is a single row. It depends only just on this middle anchor. But with the star repair or the linked triple row, the middle anchor also is linked to the lateral uh, knotless anchors. So in case for any reason that the media row fails, then you still have a double row effect instead of being a single row that may increase the stability of the construct. So the advantages of this uh, technique may be anatomic reduction of the cuff, decrease, uh, increase the greater contact area, greater contact pressure, more points of fixation, improved visualization when tying the medial row knots with highly secured footprint. So maybe a more effective repair strategy can be guaranteed. The disadvantages, yes, increase the cost of the number of the anchors, but uh, you have to do what is best for the patients, uh, not what is best in your hands, uh, and a little bit increase the operative time. So my home message, with partial or small or medium cuff tears, you have the option to do single or double row, but I think with larger massive tear, a, a, a double row or nowadays triple or star repair may be the option. As I usually said, large and massive tears may need an extra row, also try the Big Mac or nowadays the, the star repair, a more modification of the triple row. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so, uh, after this uh, heavy meal of uh, the cuff, let's step uh, one uh, further step forward and let me ask you, cuff and superior capsule, do we need both? Between tradition and evolution in this lecture, I will try to reveal the prime element of the rotator cuff tear. Is it the traditional rotator cuff tendons or the, or the, uh, 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 the uh, crucial superior capsule? But before I jump into my talk, let's first ask you a 
theoretical or abstract question. How to answer a scientific question like, do we need both capsule or the tendon? To answer this question, you must pursue the
in the motion of the uh, normal motion of the inner neural uh, joint. <coughs> Two years earlier, you um, uh, pointed out the crucial element of the central structure that converts the unforced couple to, to the, the, the balanced force couple into unforced and balanced force couple of the central structure. They pointed out this crucial element is the rotator cuff cave. And when it is disrupted, there is loss of head depression with resultant and to superior head escape that ends up with detrimental effect on the neural joint. Recently, uh, Steve Orford uh, concluded uh, the same. And he said that unbalanced force couple with the resultant pseudoparesis occurred when one anchor of the cable, either the anterior cable uh, anchor to the lesser fibrosity or the posterior anchor to the greater fibrosity is disrupted. And this rotator cable, which is the crucial structure of the normal biomechanics, is nothing but thickening <coughs> of the superior tendon. It is not part of the tender spot. It is thickening of the superior tendon. And the only way to reverse this situation is reconstruct, repair this crucial superior tendon either by actual or human version of uh, Our uh, institute, we did a very uh, vast uh, meta analysis uh, on six studies. Uh, on uh, 266 cases of uh, superior capsular reconstruction, me and uh, Amr Ahmed and Haysam Haroun, and we find both techniques to have good clinical outcome. Maybe the fascia lata group has a little bit higher, but non significant, uh, higher uh, assess score, a higher improvement in the acromiohumeral distance, but significantly lower return rate as compared to the dermal allograft, talking about the fascial, uh, uh, fascial lata autograft group. Uh, Dr. Borchardt and co-workers uh, came out with a very nice study, uh, and they discussed two clinical scenarios. One scenario is the uh, uh, suprascapular nerve injuries uh, with intact cuff. Uh, they said that uh, still these kinds of these kind of patients still can do overhead activities due to the intact superior uh, capsule that maintains the stable fulcrum of the shoulder joint unless uh, the, the the superior capsule is intact while the tendon is not working it is there but it's not working the second uh, scenario is the gotelier three and four patients when the, you repair these kind of tear, tears with the pseudoparesis and fatty infiltration. The fatty infiltration will continue while the reversal of the pseudoparesis occurs. Because, again, the essential lesion was the superior capsule that has been restored. And they propose the actual function of the tendinous part of the rotator cuff is the uh, uh, superior capsular nutrition mobilization of superior capsule and augmentation of the superior capsule and decrease the strain to the superior capsule. And rotator cuff repair gives good outcomes only when the superior capsule is repaired simultaneously. And they ask, is past a lesion of Dr. Castagna is a cuff or a superior capsular tear? And a tailored algorithm according to the superior capsular condition was proposed. If a small and medium and partial tear uh, and the uh, superior capsule is intact, you can do simple repair. In large mobile non-delaminated tears, you can do either double row or transosseous equivalent repair. But in large mobile delaminated, you must go with the formal double row where Every lamina should be repaired uh, independently to the greater tuberosity. But enlarged, retracted, 
where you cannot bring back the superior capsule to its place again, you should do uh, either slide and robust fixation or do better for the patient to do superior capsule reconstruction. In um, superior capsule reconstruction, as I said, uh, you can either do it with the uh, uh, transderm, uh, the dermal allograft, or the fascia lata. In fascia lata, we do uh, take a long strip of fascia lata and fold it uh, four to six times to reach five millimeter or more thickness. Uh, then, after putting the anchors, you pass the suture out, all the suture, and uh, pass it into the graft. Then pass the graft into the joint to fix the graft into bone. First, we tie the glenoid sutures, then the greater tuberosity sutures. Excuse me. In a double row fashion, as you see. And finally, you can. Uh, link the repair to the uh, remnant of the supraspinatus. My take home message is superior capsule is a distinct essential anatomical structure. It turns to be important functional kinematic unit of the shoulder with undeniable biomechanical importance. And its repair in rotator cuff tears should be given a careful consideration to guarantee good outcomes. And finally, superior capsule reconstruction stays in the backstage to rescue the irreparable situations. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sobhi. Now, uh, discussion, because we are short of time, we will allow uh, very few discussions in order to, to catch the lunch. First, uh, uh, talk about past lesions when and how to treat it? Dr. Basim? Uh, I have a question. Uh, in some cases, you, you don't see a pasta lesion. Uh, and you don't see a partial uh, joint side or a bursal side lesion. But you see... Intratendinous. A, you see elongation of the yeah. tendon and uh, it, it, it makes symptom of secondary impingement due to superior migration of the head through elevation. How do you treat these cases? Well, first of all, the tough part is understanding what's wrong. Because again, you may have this sort of um, elongation, as you call it, that can be a tear that is healed with a rupture in continuity that is described. So in this case, you need to remove all the scar tissue that is there and then make a complete repair. Because it is not just a tear, it is probably something that healed in the wrong way. The other option is that you have a cleavage plane between the capsule, the superior capsule and the tendon. Then it is tough to understand what to do again. But uh, you know the bubble test, uh, just to, to detect it, if it is there, uh, I put some, some stitches side to side, resorbable, just to create some local reaction and glue together the two, the two tissues. Uh, the second uh, talk, what do we have to consider when treating cuff tears? Dr. Mohammed? Actually, I have a question to most of the panel um, about suprascapular nerve ablation. There was an era of suprascapular nerve entrapment, and you have to release it. And now I he I've heard that about suprascapular nerve ablation. With massive cuff tear, you go to cut the suprascapular nerve or to burn the nerve as a, a source of pain in the shoulder. Do you have any comment about this issue? Uh, my comment is that personally, I very, very rarely do that. I should say almost never. I never did that. I, I don't believe in it. So I see, don't see a reason. What's the reason? I have been with one surgeon from UK that he told me that he doing suprascapular nerve ablation. He cuts the nerve with massive rotator cuff tear as it's a cause of pain in shoulder. 
uh, as a to relieve the pain but, but, was but again it is not a sensory nerve it has a motor function for the supraspinates and infraspinatus i think that uh, this is not an idea i have, uh, I have two comments first makes no sense for me also because there's a motor function there if you cut there you may damage function of so it's, it's not only a sensitive or a proprioception nerve is a is a, is a is a functional nerve so it doesn't make sense i like i think that surgeons like to make crazy things sometimes i mean if I can release the suprascapular nerve, maybe I, I can get home and say I'm a better surgeon. Um, and that was many things, not only suprascapular nerve, there's many things that goes like that. But after a while, you realize that that's useless what you're doing. So in my hands, uh, there's no sense for going there and try to find it. Although they have those rare cases of a suprascapular nerve entrapment. But not like people used to do, oh, I'm going to do a cuff and I'm going to release the subscap nerve. It doesn't, doesn't make any sense for me. Now, the, the third uh, talk about the star repair, I think it was clear, no questions. <laughs> uh, I have a question. Yeah. Dr. Isaac? Yeah. Uh, for the panel also, it is a wisdom. Uh, Dr. Castagna, he said he was fellow of Dr. Snyder. And Dr. Snyder is fond of biology and crimson the wall and decrease suture number to, uh, to decrease the ischemia of the tissue. So what is your uh, philosophy? Uh, how many anchors? Fifth row, sixth row, star, uh, octa. So oh, how, how many suture uh, will be yeah. good? Uh, oh. So the, there is a nice study by Mechanical just published about the, the number of the anchors because uh, they found that the interconnection you put less loads in each anchor. So exactly when you, put, when you build a, a, a tower on a three uh, columns or on five, so you decrease the stresses on the anchors. Exactly the same. And this is the idea of the triple row or the star repair. Because when you tie the, the middle anchor first, you decrease the tension on the other medial two anchors instead of tensioning the two anchors and more tension that leads to m more failure. So uh, the idea of the triple row is to distribute the tension and not to increase it. I have a question also to uh, uh, <coughs> Dr. Kastanya. You, uh, you uh, wrote your book about the trans repair and we know before arthroscopy the uh, golden standard was to do a transosseous uh, open repair of the tendon and all the studies have proven that uh, footprint uh, reconstruction has the best results so do you see there is a role of this uh, strategy in uh, arthroscopic rotator cuff repair and especially you know this tailor stitch technique and the joint needle technique what do you think about that yeah, yeah. I, I was not making any comment, but I'm moving more and more into the to the transosseous repair because, again, it is the gold standard. You define this, and I remember your giant needle. You described the technique with that. Uh, I think that all the effort that we are doing, including the double row, uh, transosseous equivalent, and so on, are trying to mimic in this. So uh, I, I believe that there is a great future for that for two reasons. It is effective. I, I did a, a randomized control studies for comparing uh, anchors and transosseus, and clinically they do the same. I mean, uh, when we do rotator cuff repair, the clinical outcome is very similar. But what I noticed is that we had less Sugaya type 3 healing, that is again uh, rupturing continuity, so maybe better biologically speaking. Number three, uh, at least in my country, but probably almost everywhere, almost in the U.S. in the near future, cost effectiveness of what we do is important. I'm becoming more and more uh, eager to that, the ICER, the qualities and all that stuff that will influence very much our job in the future. So we need to look solutions that are giving, providing, first of all, good quality treatment for the patient, but they must be also cost effective. Just a comment on that, 
there is this future pastor, Butch Krishnan uses future pastors. All, all his cases, he doesn't use anchors. I don't know what's the impact and cost, what does the impact in, in medical industry, but the fact is that he always, for a long time, been using those future pastors. I think from Tournier or whatever. He used three or four holes, and he can do exactly what you do with a big needle, but using the arthroscopic procedures. And so very nice transosseous. Yeah, it's, it, it is the same. It is called the transosseous equivalent. Exactly. The suture bridge is the transosseous. So the same principle, but different technique. It's cheaper. Mm. Yes, this is the. Okay. Cheaper and less complication. Oh. Yeah? Dr. Ayman? Uh, yeah, well, I, I, I enjoyed very much your, uh, your talk. Um, um, very good technique, but uh, um, you mentioned in your explanation for the failure that the failure happens at the level of the medial row. This is the literature. At the, at the musculotendinous junction. Yeah. So, uh, what is the value of adding an extra fixation more lateral to this um, uh, uh, anchor? Yeah, this is um, a good question. About this one, this is the, the function of the middle anchor that to decrease the tension on the medial anchors because they saw that the failure comes from applying more tension when suturing the medial anchors. So you put more tension that leads to early failure. So you tie first the middle anchor that decreases the tension. So when you tie the medial row, you tie it in a less in a reduced uh, tendon with a less tension on the sutures. So this is the idea. The idea also of star repair that the middle anchor is not separate. It is connected also to the lateral anchor. So for any reason that the medial fail, there is a still a double row construct. Don't you think that we are, we are really in need for um, uh, an innovative, perhaps an industrial solution for introducing um, a kind of graft or so to help with these massive tears? Yeah, yeah, this is this is also produced as the superior capsule reconstruction, or the uh, the fascia lata and so on. But as long as the tendon permits you to do a repair, don't burn your bridges. Try to use it, try to apply it, and even if for any reason it fails, you still have the graft solution. Thank you very much. It's great. Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, Dr. Maher. In microphone. Thank you. Uh, just a little comment. I uh, to decrease the number of the anchors and uh, do the rubble, uh, the double uh, row technique. I take the sutures by the same uh, uh, principle of the double row, and I put the sutures in the soft tissue in the lateral aspect of the head. Or even I pass it transosseous by making a hole by K-wire and passing a separate needle to tie the sutures and doing the same effect of the double row without using two anchors. By the yeah, same is it the same of the double row? Or yes, you mean but, you, may, you but make I it don't it use anchors. I don't use... I use an, just sutures. So you make uh, it... Uh, just sutures. Uh, so you to, make it open. Uh, yes, in the mini open technique. Ah, uh, the mini the open. Mini, oh, it's okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, now the last talk about the rotator cuff and the superior capsule, Dr. Subhi. So, Dr. Muhammad. The thickness, the thickness of the uh, the iliotibial graft or fascia lata, uh, the thicker you can take or you can do is better. Uh, when Mihata uh, represent his work, actually his graft is pretty thick, something like eight millimeters or something. And I asked him personally how you can t uh, make a, such a thick graft, and he said that you can take your uh, iliotibial band a little bit posterior uh, at the lateral intermuscular septum where you can take the thickest part of the iliotibial graft. So he is not worried to take something like 7 or 8 millimeter thickness. And some uh, author proposed that the retail rate or the higher uh, and better acromiohumeral distance uh, improvement with the fascia lata 
refer this to the better thickness or higher thickness of the fascia lata graft over the, uh, the, the dermal allograft. Dermal allograft is something like three to four millimeter thickness, okay? And, but with fascia lata, I will be very satisfied if I can reach five millimeter thickness. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I, I want to ask one question to Dr. Hey. Uh, Dr. Sophie, yes. in the early 80s, that was an era of doing a lot of fascia lata for large rotator cuff tears open. And I, I was there, I'm old to see these. So the cases came all with a problem of recurrence with elevation, weakness of elevation, and uh, damage of the fascia lata on the long run, so they stopped doing that. Now you are doing that again arthroscopically. Is there a difference in, 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 the, yeah, the, in, I, in your late uh, yeah, results? Yeah, I, I, I mentioned this uh, in one slide. Uh, mere patch grafting either with iliotibial uh, graft or scaffold or something. Uh, the point is the early uh, trials did the medial fixation to the soft tissue of the uh, remnant of the cuff. Uh, they didn't uh, regain the fulcrum of the motion of the shoulder. But with the superior capsule reconstruction, the medial attachment of the superior capsule is attached to the glenoid. This is the bone fixed uh, point where you can regain the biomechanics, not only a spacer, but it depressed the head and regained the fulcrum, the normal fulcrum of the uh, the whole cholesterol of the superior capsule and the rotator cuff. And this regained the normal biomechanics. Thank you, Dr. Subhi. We have to end the session because the time of the lunch. Uh, there is a missing eyeglass. I wish that Nashi. Dr. Uh, Nasser ah. Slim from Mansoura and Mustafa Rafat from Qasr al Aini can compare their result because Mustafa Rafat has uh, leaving the biceps uh, attached to the glenoid and fixing it is a greater porosity while uh, Nasser was just taking the biceps through cuff and uh, uh, fig, uh, uh, leaving yeah. it from the glenoid so uh, it can answer the, the question of uh, Dr. Uh, yes now uh, we uh, we have the honor now to to thank Dr. Uh, Alexandro Castagna Dr. Castagna with there is a small gift from the Ega yeah, we are very happy to have you here to and to cover you and to cover also your friends. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I will send you, I will send you. Okay, another one. Thank you. There is one by name of Enrico. I will give you. Okay. okay.